Hi everyone, welcome to week 12. Um, this week we're going to be holding on to some of the concepts that we've discussed thus far in the course, um, namely normativity, incommensurability, and identity. And we'll be going further into a critical dialogue in refiguring these concepts and then moving toward thinking about other possible futures that are in the midst of these reconfigurations. So we've read this week chapter six in Alexis Shotwell's book, Against Purity. And we're to begin our discussion this week of this chapter, I'd like to highlight some of her pro propositions from previous chapters in this book. So she encourages us to think about how we might determine the kind of futures that we want and how given the fact that we're already deeply situated and woven within oppressive structures of our current world, that we can't ever stand outside of this current world, how then do we craft worlds radically different um, than what we already live? So in this way, we need to think in the midst of current normativities, not to expunge ourselves of them, but to notice the ways in which they inform how we operate within them. So we're sort of crafting new worlds, as Shotwell says, in the shell of the old. We're always thinking in the ruins of old worlds, in present troubles and times, in order to imagine what Haraway calls speculative futures. So Shotwell writes that if we see the world as relational, as made of intersecting forces and discourses that cultivate the ways in which gender, identity, and ability are performed and understood, then the ways, uh, or sorry, then saying that we want to wholly rid ourselves of normalized thinking is impossible because we're always already in relationship with these discourses and enacting um, our responses with others. So these normativities, given their flexual, um, instable, unstable nature, means that they could also be imagined in what Shotwell calls terrain of as a terrain of possibilities. So normativity is then both restraining and enabling because it's continually in flux. It's a push and pull that we actively negotiate as we enact responses and co-compose our subjectivities within these movements. So what I want you to really focus on is this aspect of relationality. Um, this interdependency between moving parts and how inter thinking about interdependency suggests that it's inadequate to only think about the individual. So in your responses on the forums, I want you to move beyond talking about what individual educators need to do to solve inequities, um, that individual morality is the basis of, um, of our possible futures because it ignores social compositions and relations and this very orientation to thinking of individual morality and agency perpetuates in some ways the inequities that it's trying to alleviate because it's situated in a euro western thought that's based in possessive individualism and this is something that a lot of our texts this term is trying to trouble are trying to trouble um, so our discussion in this discussions in this course are not about degree uh, agreeing on a product that will save us from difference that will solve once and for all inequity, but rather this course is about engaging in dialogue as processual um, that's unsettling and thinking through something in order to complexify it, not to simplify it with a one off solution. So with this, use the forums as a space to tease out thinking in relation with the readings, not to offer solutions about what educators ought to do. And as Shotwell proposes, avoid the purity and complacency of an answer. Stay with the tensions of thinking through something in its incompleteness. 
So in this week's chapter, you might notice some threads that link well to some of our previous readings. Um, so consider how Shotwell takes up identity and how her writing suggests uh, something similar to Tuck and Yang in that identity is not imagined here as stagnant, that the term identity has perhaps exceeded the limits of its own project, as Shotwell writes, because it veils the complexity of relations that continue to refigure themselves in the composition of social worlds. So Shotwell writes, quote, social realities always exceed the categories that aim to represent them, end quote. And I think this is an excellent example of the work of post-structural and feminist theory and practice. Um, that, that question these categories and imagine other possible formations that are tentative and responsive to shifting social discourses. So when we suggest final answers, we're reaffirming a fixation of these categories that limit ongoing thought and that sort of punctuate dissensus with an impossible finality. Shotwell also speaks about incommensurability not as something that's to be avoided, not as something that um, we want to fully come to know um, or to fully come to know others in order to value them, but rather, um, as it's suggested in our previous readings, Shotwell is proposing that holding on to incommensurability, valuing the unknowability of others is central in sustaining multiplicity and different ways of being. So something to be careful of is this very familiar phrase in education, and I think um, in our forums it's come up a few times, is this idea that we're all different and that thus makes us the same. That underneath uh, the difference of physical features like skin tone, hair, eye color, etc., we're actually all the same. Um, if there is a big idea that you can take away from this week, please consider this quote by Alexa Shotwell. She writes, we are all indeed non-standard, but how that affects us is profound, is, depends profoundly on a whole complex of social relations of inequality, end quote. And that's on page 168. So this means that there is no sameness in how we're affected by norms or oppression. So to say that we're the same underneath it all or that educators must treat everyone the same is to ignore power. It's to ignore positionality, histories, and to ignore differences and movement. So it creates futures that are based on the sameness that we're trying to challenge. So how then do we hold on to this responsibility as educators to imagine futures that are speculative, that are not yet, that are uh, perhaps more possible to sustaining difference, futures that are perhaps more livable than the ones in which we currently live? So what kinds of conditions in early childhood education and what kinds of orientations to thinking and being in the world might help us to become more able to respond to difference in ethical ways, um, how um, we might hold space to meet another in ways which value difference, in ways which sustain and maintain difference. So on page 179, Shotwell borrows from Sarah Ahmed in writing, quote, there are many ways of being oriented toward a future, some of which unfurl along an unexpected orientation, some of which deviate from the path laid out for us, end quote. Yet in imagining um, these paths, we cannot be romantic. Um, we must be, as Shotwell writes, thinking about a wounded flourishing in a way that honors complexity. So I encourage you to stay with this complexity, this sort of idea of wounded flourishing, that there is no purity um, in your writing. So in your forums and also in your synopsis. Um, so for example, when you're painting or drawing, using only white offers something, but it draws the eye to the lightness of something, the surface of things. We need to draw with white and also with darkness as well um, if we are to think about dimension if we're to think about complexity of something we can rely on 
the nuances of these intersection, intersecting colors, um, to think with um, complexity and the contrasts between things. Um, so with this said, I'm going to offer you um, some guidance on your upcoming synopsis assignment. Um, so if you look at your um, assignment uh, description document, the last assignment is the synopsis of selected texts. It's worth 20% of your mark and it's due on April 14th. So in this assignment, you'll select two readings from the reading list, different from those that you discussed in your roundtable assignment, and discuss how the authors orient themselves to a key course topic. Um, so topics could include things from this list, including identity, gender, difference, care, heteronormativity, uh, the politics of the body, and performativity. And I'm also going to add incommensurability. Um, other topics are possible, but please um, have a conversation with me before uh, going ahead with that. Um, your synopsis should also draw on and refer to some of the ideas from your peers' roundtable conversations that discuss those chosen readings. This doesn't necessarily mean that you need to agree with your peers, but rather draw on a, an idea that they bring forward and tease it out within the context of the readings in your discussion. So in your synopsis, you'll be thinking with the following questions. What are the author's main arguments with regard to the topic? What are the theoretical lenses that they might be looking from? So this is an opportunity for you to further discuss post-structural uh, theory, post-foundational theory that we discussed, I think, in week three or week four. Um, what are the authors proposing? What are they challenged by? How might this topic live in early childhood education? Why is this topic, why does this topic matter to us? Um, and what questions do the articles or roundtables provoke you toward? So when you're writing this, uh, this piece, I encourage you to try and open up possibilities for dialogue by thinking through questions, problems, and puzzles, rather than thinking about answers or solutions um, in order to have a gener generativity um, in your writing. So the written synopsis should be well written. It should be a carefully proofread um, document for grammar, spelling, language use. You should be using APA here. Um, so I encourage you to visit the resources on Moodle for APA help and really use those as a basis for your formatting. Um, this is an easy way to, to bump up your grade is by following these formats. Um, and what else? This should be written in your own words. I'm okay with you using quotes from the readings, which I think that you should use quotes from the readings, but do not rely too much on quotes. If you have long block quotations, it's going to take up too much space and not allow for you to really tease out your own thinking. So with that said, the occasional short quote or phrase from the readings is acceptable and encouraged, but I really also um, expect that you're using your own words and that you're showing how you're making sense of these quotes. So the synopsis should focus on the quotes that I uh, offered for you um, and that you'll be really focusing on the ideas that are proposed from the articles. So this is not necessarily an assignment for you to um, like provide your opinion about the topic, but rather situate your understanding in the context of the literature and demonstrate how you're making sense of the texts. Um, so the written synopsis will be no more than 1400 words, excluding the title page and references. It'll be double spaced times New Roman and 12 point font. Um, and again, it will follow APA guidelines. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it for this week, everybody. Looking forward to our dialogue in the forums and seeing how you take up this concept um, of impurity brought forth by Shotwell. Thanks a lot.